Yeah, good day. It's Charlie ZL2 CTM. Well, I um, have had the opportunity to um, solder up this um, this amplifier here. Um, before I go any further, just a reminder: um, this particular channel is not out there to design the greatest and latest um, your radios. The whole intent of me putting these up has always been to 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 put up simple simple radios. Simple circuits, you know, in my eyes, simple, um, in an effort to encourage others to, to give it a go, a homebrew that is. So um, please don't construe this as, you know, being this is the best possible circuit out there. Um, and the other caveat too, and I've mentioned this many times on previous videos, uh, I am not an expert in any way, shape or form. I'm not an RF design engineer, I'm certainly not a professor at some university teaching this. Um, so again, this is just purely me playing around, me making up the circuits and just seeing how they perform. So um, yeah, I just thought that would be useful just to repeat that again. Um, and the, I guess the other thing too, uh, where, I, where I can, I, I would like to try and understand how the circuits work. Um, and I guess the bent I have is to try and work it out mathematically. So. If I can find a circuit which has got supporting maths, fantastic. Um, or, for example, in the EMF, EMRFD um, publication, this particular amplifier here is in section 2.7 uh, when it's talking about feedback amplifiers. And it provides, uh, for this particular circuit here, a, a whole raft of, as I mentioned, I think a couple of videos back, really large formulas which really lend themselves to be put into a spreadsheet and then manipulated with um, the degeneration, which is this one here, and just one hiding over the back there, the, the um, feedback resistor from the collector. So if you recall, I'll just to zoom out a little bit, this is the, the topology of that particular amplifier here. So again, running a, let me just grab a pointing stick, running a, a 2N3904 uh, with both emitter de degeneration here and this feedback generation or feedback resistor here from the collector back through to the base. Now the biasing resistors RE and R1 and R2 um, are not part of the feedback. They are there purely to set the, the uh, biasing point for this particular device here. So again, this one comes out of uh, EMRFD and like I say, those big long formulas are there to allow you, based on the device you're using and its FT, the quiescent current what the load is, what you're presenting to the collector, um, you can then, through those formulas, determine what this value here will be, what that value there will be, and therefore what the input um, impedance will look like in terms of resistance and, and the output. So, yeah, again, that's that's my bent and, and that's, that's what I like. Anyway, so at the moment that's up and running. Uh, I thought I would probably just go through, I guess, this, the um, how it's performing and then we'll look at the circuit itself. So at the moment I'm putting into it a uh, 7.15 megahertz signal. Um, again this is this is going to be in the 40 meter band so that's halfway through the band there. The yellow trace is the output and the purple trace there is the input and that's sitting just on 30, or in fact just over 13 dB of gain. Um, so that's not too bad. I'll, I'll live with that for now. If should it turn out down track with the radio built that I uh, need more gain, then I can look to uh, have a play around with those um, biasing, so again, those feedback uh, resistors. But at this stage of the game, I'm going to keep that as it is and just soldier on. So, the circuit itself, as I just mentioned, it's a um, common emitter uh, BJT circuit using feedback on both the emitter and the uh, collector. So for this here I have, if you recall in the couple of videos back when I was working out the gain distribution I decided that I wanted to have two milliamps of current flowing through this device here just to try and minimize any uh, noise generation. So again, I shouldn't say again, but I'm not going to go through the baths. Um, I will put this up on the blog but suffice to say, I'm um, using the same sorts of calculations we've used before for setting up the biasing point. I've got one volt sitting here, so I've decided to have one, uh, two milliamps passing through the collector and the quiescent, and I've set the emitter at uh, two volts. 
So therefore Ohm's law is very straightforward to work out what the emitter resistor needs to be. Um, just remind again with the voltage divider biasing here to, to make this point here, the voltage being applied to the base nice and stiff so to speak. Uh, we want to have 10 times the base current I go over the electron flow, so it's coming through here and up to VCC. So I want to have at least 10 times that flowing through this voltage divider here. So that's the kind of maths you'll see down here. Later on, if you were to go through it, you will see figures down here of, for example, R1. I want to have 11 times because it's 10 going through plus the additional one um, base current. And then for R2, the lower one here, it's, it's only um, 10 times the base current. So again, not going to go through these. Uh, now for the output circuit, uh, I'm going to have this sitting at 50 ohms. So I want to present 200 ohms to the collector, but I want to hook this up to a, uh, a 50 ohm mixer because the mixer will be the one that's downstage of this, the SBL1. So we need to work out what the transformer is going to be. So uh, turns ratio, so N equals the square root of uh, R1 over R2, so 200 ohms over 50 ohms comes out at 2. So in terms of uh, windings, I could go with, say, uh, 5 to 10 or 6 to 2. In this particular case, I've sort of just gone straight for 6 to 12, which is uh, a ratio which I've used before in the past. Um, the other little rule of thumb is the this, this smaller winding, which in this particular case needs to, is the 6 turn winding, it's inductive reactance, so XL equals 2 pi FL, needs to be that sort of 4 to 5 times um, the, the load or the resistance hanging off that particular winding. So in this particular case, if we go back up to the schematic, I've got off that smaller winding here, the 6 turn winding, 50 ohms. So I want at least 4 to 5 that, so 4, 5 to 20, up to um, 25. So if I work that out, XL equals 2 pi FL, 2 pi times 7 megs. Yes, strictly speaking, it should be you know, 7 point... Um, no, 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 I'll take that back. That's the lowest frequency of operation, that's why I put 7 megs there. So 2 pi F and L. So L, the inductance, so I'm using an FT37-43. Um, I use a website, Toroids Online, which is a nice way of determining the inductance um, for a whole range of Toroids. Uh, if I go to the FT37-43 page, I uh, toss in six turns, and that turns out to be 12.6 microhenries. So stuffing that value now back into our XL formula, our inductive reactance, we come out at 554 ohms, which is much greater, well greater, they're now 4 to 5 times 50. So a big tick there. Um, I then went down a level, so I thought, well, okay, that's that's great. How about, um, that should be too reflective, uh, 10 turns to 5 turns. So again, remember we need to have a, an N of 2. So 5 times 2 equals 10, so it meets that requirement. The smaller turns ratio here, again on an FT37-43, comes out at 8.75 microhenries putting that into our XL formula and we come out with 384 ohms which is still greater than 4 to 5 times 50 so big tick there as well and that's what I've elected to use so 10 turns to 5 turns is, you, is what you see down here that's uh, 5 turns on the load which is that little 50 ohm resistor there uh, up to uh, 10 turns so transforming that 50 ohms up to 200 ohms to present to the collector uh, and that's about it actually, so that's probably all I'm going to say here. Um, what I did do yesterday when I was soldering this up after work, I just threw the camera on and just did a little bit of recording of I think I was putting on that device there, that little resistor there in the emitter circuit. So I just elected to record five, five minutes or so of the approach that I take for um, making these um, circuits on the strip board here. So again, if, if, you, if you're not interested in that, you can stop here. If you are interested in that, then keep on playing. Um, and as I've sort of slotted in there. That's all I want to say here. So like I say, pretty happy with that. Um, and while it's not exactly, or it's pretty damn close to the game that I wanted, at this stage of the game, I'm not going to tweak any of those feedback resistors. I'll just wait till the, uh, the overall radio is built, and we'll go from there. So what I might do now, I might just explore a direct conversion 
configuration before launching into the rest of the circuits to convert it into a, um, a single sideband uh, receiver. Anyway, 73, take care, and uh, we will see you next time. Yeah, I thought I'd just throw into the middle of this video um, just a little, I guess, snippet of how I um, how I build these circuit boards. So as I've said before, I use this strip board here, this sort of, um, well, this copper strip board. I've given that just a bit of a polish with some emery paper just to um, help with the, the soldering and helps for the, um, the flux to, to wet out. So I'm currently making up this amplifier here. And if you look closely, I think it's... Maybe I can zoom up a little bit there. If you look closely, the way I lay out the the circuit here on the actual board, it mirrors pretty well what's actually drawn on the schematic. So if I was to point out some, some components there, so this coupling capacitor here is this 100 nanofarad, and if you look closely down there, I've used this drill to just sort of um, gently push down and, and twirl and you can cut the track. So I've created, I've created a gap there which has now been straddled by that capacitor. If you look closely we can also see uh, from, uh, from well okay I'll go back a step. How I lay this out, the bottom track, and I mentioned this before in a, in a video some time ago, the bottom track is ground, the next, next track up is, is emitter, base, collector, then it's VCC and another ground. So that's how I typically lay out the boards, and then I make the circuit match that configuration. If it's a really complex circuit, for example, a couple of J10s that are in um, CAS code, then clearly I need a few more um, rows. But uh, in this particular case, generic, you know, more often than not, it's ground, emitter, base, collector, VCC, and like I say, another ground. That's exactly what we'd have here. So we've got our, our 2N3904. You can see that the emitter and the base collector are there. If you run back on the base back to here, just after that coupling capacitor, you can see R2. That's this one here between the base and ground. You can see R1 between the base and the VCC. That's this one here. You can start to see now the... Oh, sorry, you can't see this very well, but um, I'm going to put it in the, the video anyway. You can see the feedback here between the collector and the base. And you can see that just there. There goes our collector, there goes the capacitor straddling another cut hole, and then the 750 ohm bringing that, that feedback signal back to the base. So that's exactly what's going on there. Um, I'm just in the process now of finishing off the uh, emitter de uh, degeneration. So I've already soldered in the 100 nanofarad capacitor, and it's going to put in this, uh, this 1 ohm resistor here. So that's going to go between uh, this side of that capacitor, uh, to ground. So all I do there is I make it so nice and easy so you can read it. I bend it over. I then use some uh, long nose pliers just basically bend it over and that creates a bend uh, in the legs. And why I do that is when I go to cut it rather than cutting right up at the knee or where I've made that bend if I just bring it back, you know, half a millimetre is all that's needed, then I can create a couple of little feet. I don't know if that shows up very well, but it's now curved ever so slightly and it's made a little foot. And that little foot is way smaller than the track and it just helps to, um, help to, I guess, mount the component on the board. That's why I do. The other thing too, before I forget, each time you solder something, or the way I do it, is I just spin it around and I just check the back. I just make sure that I've got no solder uh, poking through those holes because as you can imagine this is now going to sit onto a copper backplane and we don't want to sh um, short circuit parts of the circuit uh, to, um, to ground. If you ever do have one of those little uh, little dots coming through all you have to do is bring your soldering up just touch it and it just disappears. It literally just, just disappears. It doesn't reflow this side but it's just enough for the, um, I guess the, the heat, oh, what's the word, surface tension of the solder just to sort of pull it back into the hole and it just disappears. So you can see here, uh, there's none of those are poking through, so that's all good. So now that I've created that leg, what I tend to do is two things. I, uh, I like to tin the component itself. So let me just zoom out a bit. Sorry for the uh, professional videoing here. 
a little bit fiddly but I sort of got used to it. I just hold it down and I just put a little bit of solder to the two, to the two feet. And that just helps when I marry it up to the solder on this side, it just wets nicely, nice and easy. Rightio, I want to go, like I said, uh, that's still in view there, I think it is. I want to go from the capacitor, so put a blob of solder there, to ground. So you can see where it's going to go now, it's going to go between the end of that capacitor and ground. And then it's just a matter of bringing it up. Connect one side first, drop, it's in. Bring the back side around, and it's now connected. So that's now soldered. Double check on this side, nothing's come through. Uh, what I tend to do also is, it's probably not going to show up very well on the video, as I hold it up to the light, it's probably just going to come through and no more. And I just, by shining a strong light through it, you can see the, um, the light coming through between the tracks, and it's very, very easy to quickly see if you've got a short circuit. And that's the component I've just put in there, down here, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. And that's done. So that's uh, another component in. Just make it look nice and neat, nice and square. And then that is now the resistor from that DC uh, decoupling um, to earth. So that's our one ohm resistor. And what I'll do there, as you can see in the circuit over here, that still shows up, yep. Um, I no longer require anything else coming off the emitter. So I've got the, the emitter biasing resistor and the decoupling, or well, the feedback, or part of the feedback circuit, the degeneration. So what I can do now is, I just say it's good practice for myself, is I now just give that a bit of a twirl. Hold up the light. Yes, I've definitely cut the track, and I've now completed... Um, the emitter circuits. There's no more uh, signal. So what I do there is anything I'm, I'm doing down here, that signal then can't feed back and um, impinge on on the uh, on the emitter circuit. Uh, and there's actually another cut hole here at the other end, which defines the left and right of that. Look, I'm just sort of talking as I uh, as I do stuff here, so I'm probably not making a huge amount of sense. But um, so far, I think nice and neat. So well, as far as I can see, it's nice and neat. That's pretty well there, so if I look back on the main circuit, I've still got to um, put the 10 ohm resistor in on the VCC line coming in, the 100 nanofarad and the 100 microfarad uh, decoupling, that's going to be nice and easy. I'll just dedicate a portion over here, probably, I'll probably bring the, the um, on this VCC line here, I'll bring in uh, 12 volts to here, I'll cut a track here, put that 10 ohm resistor in. And then it's just a matter of having those two capacitors between that line and the other ground, which is nice and easy and close, uh, and keeps things nice and easy. And then what I'll then what I'll do, um, as I've mentioned before, I use these. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. I just use the solder wick, and I um, I just saturate a portion with with um, solder, and then it's just a matter of um, putting a blob of solder there bringing it up and then chopping it off at the appropriate length, bending it over and then that's what I use as I mentioned before as the means of mechanically attaching these little circuit boards to the ground. So I'll be doing exactly the same thing on the diagonal opposite corner because as I mentioned before that top row there is earth so once I've got the transformer mounted up here um, I'll cut it off and I'll, I'll solder on a tag up here um, diagonally opposite and that works out well. So yeah, so I'm just going to put the transformer in, those two capacitors and that resistor, and I'll be in a position to to test this out. So I'm not quite sure where I'm going to insert this in the video, but uh, maybe at the end, maybe halfway through, but but uh, I thought I haven't done something like this for a while, so I thought I'd just throw a little bit of a blurb uh, about the approach I take for building these circuits. Um, and like I say, for HF, I mentioned it before, um, this technique using the strip board works perfectly fine in my experience. Anyway, enough said. I'll uh, I'll carry on.